Hello. So uh, today is July 23rd, uh, 2023, and I will talk about Raymond uh, Abraham, who died in 2010 uh, in a car accident in Los Angeles. Let's read a little bit about him. Raymond Johan Abra Abraham was born in 1933 in Linz, East Tyrol, Austria, or Tyrol. Throughout a 40-year career, Abraham created visionary projects and built works of architecture in Europe and the United States. From 1952 to 1958, Abraham studied at the Graz University of Technology in Austria. In 1959, he established a studio in Vienna where he explored the depths and boundaries of architecture through building, drawing, and montage. Abraham's first book, the 1965 publication, Elementare Architecture was made at a time of transition between architecture studies and practice. In this early volume on elemental structures, Abraham explores the built environment, absent aesthetic speculation, and determinations about design instead of coming from the relative level of knowledge and also the desires of the builder. In 1964, Abraham emigrated to the United States of America. Abraham was an influential architect in his native Austria and the New York avant-garde. Abraham's poetic architectural vision was influenced by the Viennese tradition to align architecture with sculpture and also by the Austrian physicist and philosopher Ernst Mach. Abraham theorized architecture on a collision course with the needs of humans yet striving for coexistence in a constant state of creative tension. Beginning in the late 1950s, his enigmatic architecture placed Abraham among the avant-garde, such as Hans Hollein, Walter Pichler, and Günther Domenic. In 1958, Abraham collaborated with Friedrich St. Florian, placing third in an international competition to design the Pan-Arabian University of Saudi Arabia, and in 1959, placing second for the design of the Democratic Republic of the Congo Cultural Center in Leopoldville. Abraham criticized mainstream architecture's preoccupation with style, its indifference to history, and the rigid definition of modernism at that time. Abraham went on to influence generations of professional architects through architectural drawings, projects, and teaching. Abraham explained his role as an educator as follows. I quote, teaching forces me to engage in a critical dialogue with somebody else and find a level of objectivity that allows me to have a fair critical argument. My role as a teacher is simply to clarify, although that's a bit simplistic. When I give a problem to the students, it's my problem. I am trying to anticipate how I could solve that problem. And my joy is when the students come up with a solution I haven't thought of. End of quotation. So this was the man smoking a cigar like many architects especially the famous ones love cigars, and he almost always had a hat on his head. In the absence of Raymond Abraham, I have this book published in Vienna, Drawings. He was very famous for his drawings. He drew indeed very, very well, and he made visionary drawings, if, I, if we had to call them so. And his drawings, tell us that even if you do not build, no one can stop you from drawing. Well, manually or digitally. If you have a vision, if you have something to believe, you believe in, you can visualize that something in the solitude of your atelier. And no one can stop you, stop you except yourself. So drawings, drawings by, um, by Raymond uh, Abraham, he has a very specific, he had a very specific way of drawing uh, and uh, his drawings are e easily recognizable.
Massimo Scolari also in Italy uh, drew sometimes in, in, in a similar way, but there are still differences between um, uh, Raymond Abraham. I think Raymond Abraham was, uh, if not obsessed, uh, at least uh, uh, aware of the finality of life. That is Thanatos, death. Architects very rarely, I think, contemplate the finality of life, but he was one who didn't. Like uh, Arata Isozaki, also born on July 23rd, uh, we see, you know, visualizations of the ruin. So he was aware of the passage of time, the erosions provoked by the passage of time. He obviously found pleasure in drawing, 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 incessantly. To an extent, maybe there is also some kind of a self-indulgence in, in, in these drawings. You know, he, they are ends in themselves, the drawings. In his later years, he became friends with Lebia Sultz, another architect who drew incessantly. And they be, there is a picture of them. There are several pictures of them, but there is one uh, taken in front of uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver in France, the last work that was built by Le Corbusier. It was built after his death. And uh, both uh, Raymond Abraham and Lebia Sultz crossed the ocean. Uh, to see this building, and uh, there is a, a moving picture with both of them on a bench facing the wall of uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver with their backs towards the photographer. I don't think I have that picture here, uh, although I wish I had. Anyway, drawings by Raymond Abraham. And I think his work is encouraging any architect or any student of architecture to not give up dreaming, but not just dreaming, you know, laying on the sofa, but being active, creating with a pencil, colored pencil or black pencil with some paper or digitally. If you love architecture and you love the spirit of architecture and you have something to say, say it. Uh, that's why I think his work is, is a yes to architecture. And I remember Bernard Chumi telling me, I think he was in a you know, friendly relationship with Raymond Abraham. Bernard Chumi told me that when he, when he was younger, uh, Raymond Abraham uh, encouraged him to, by saying, uh, you know, if you believe in something, keep going, keep going, keep going. And at one moment, um, you know, society will give up or it will be give in, will 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 follow you. It's a question, it's a question of well, question of persistence, of tenacity. Don't give up dreaming, or as uh, William Faulkner said, always dream. Always dream, but uh, Faulkner added that uh, you know you dream, but you have to fight not so much with the others, but with yourself, with your own limits. This is the artistic side of architecture. You know, the, the architect who takes seriously, uh, you know, uh, the artist within. He was also able to build, and we are going to see a few buildings built by Raymond Abraham, including the, uh, the Austrian Cultural Center in Manhattan, which uh, Kenneth Frampton uh, considered that is uh, the third or one of the three most important buildings in New York City. The other two being uh, the Guggenheim Museum, the Seagram Building, and the Austrian Cultural Center by Raymond Abraham, which you are going to see a little bit later. Exploring ideas through, through the medium of drawing was common for architects and should continue to be common for architects. Even if not built, 
architecture can manifest itself uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, significant ways and contributes the drawing, like the drawings of Santelli, Antonio Santelia. No one would deny their role in the architecture history of modernity. But Santelia, who died at 28, left behind only drawings. That one of the drawings became a built work, a monument that uh, Giuseppe Terrani built together with others after Antonio Santelia died. It's true. But again, if you have something to say in architecture, say it. Doesn't matter, you have or you don't have clients. So in this sense, I think that the graphic works of, of um, Raymond Abraham are very valuable because they are encouragements to not give up on architecture and to continue to explore. Anyone has a pencil and a piece of paper. No one can stop you to, to draw what you, what's in your mind, what is in your heart, what is in your imagination. Now we arrive at this work that I mentioned that Frampton thought was a very important building. The Austrian is a very important building. The Austrian Cultural Center in New York on a uh, very narrow uh, plot of land or site. Here we see the idealized version of the, well, these are not working drawings. They are presentation drawings and maybe they are not even presentation drawings. The architect made them for himself to explore the spirit of the building. The building, as you can see, very, very narrow. Uh, and uh, you see it here, squeezed between other buildings in, in, in Manhattan. Here again, Raymond Abraham, the, the Austrian Cultural Center in Manhattan, in New York City. I will already, if we are familiar with his graphic work, his work is easily recognizable as a, as a building by um, Raymond Abraham. The process of bringing a building into being was very important to him, as it is to other architects. That's why so many explorations, so many models and drawings, uh, perhaps no one asked ask him to do them, and perhaps no one paid him to do, it, to do them. He just did them because he was exploring the reality of the building, and he enjoyed the trip, the, the voyage, the process, uh, that led to, uh, to the final result. Now to, to, to have this building in the vicinity, so to speak of uh, hierarchical, hi hierarchical um, um, vicinity of uh, the Guggenheim Museum and the Seagram building by Miss van der Rohe, you know, is, uh, is not a little thing. Uh, I didn't say, it, but uh, Raymond Abraham taught at the Cooper Union uh, in, uh, in, New York, in New York City, a very important architecture school run, uh, I mean, the dean of the school for many years, more than 20 years, was John Haydock, one of the New York Five. Now it's Nader Tehrani. Uh, a, very, a very important school, uh, and a school where, you know, there was no tuition. I don't know how it is now, but brilliant students uh, got in. And I think they only offer a bachelor degree, not a master degree. But at the time when John Haydock was leading the school, it was considered one of the best architecture schools in the world. Uh, and there were important uh, architects teaching there or important architects who studied there, like Elizabeth Diller and even uh, Daniel Lipskind, 
Peter Eisenman was teaching the Diana Grest, uh, you know, uh, a very, very potent uh, architecture school and very, very uh, explorative. I can only wish there were more architecture schools in the world, like the Cooper Union. Although maybe <laughs> to quote, uh, you know, from Albin Boyarski and from, uh, you know, someone in the audience here, maybe Cooper Union also, you know, generated uh, unemployable mavericks to an extent at least. But I think we need these unemployable uh, uh, mavericks badly because they are the oppositional force. They are those who resist, to quote um, Lebia Suits, resist, resist, resist. These, um, these people who are not at ease in the world and in society, they actually promote perhaps what is best in society and unexpressed. And it is expressed by them, by these uh, unemployable uh, you know, um, deviant uh, characters. I love them. Drawings, drawings. You can imagine these drawings. Nobody paid for them. They were not. They were made for the pleasure of the artist, the pleasure of the architect. He enjoyed in the metaphysics. He found joy in the metaphysics of architecture. He was probably drawing every day, <laughs> maybe not 24 hours, but at least 15. Perhaps the building seen from the back, his hat and the fragment of his head. It's not such a tall building, but being so narrow, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, tall. Now this is a housing complex or a building, an apartment building, a block of flats on Friedrichstrasse 32-33 in Berlin. As you know, Berlin had three uh, times in the 20th century when in a very inspired and inspiring way invited some of the most famous architects to build blocks of flats and even some houses in 1930s, in 1950s, and in 1980s. This is from the 1980s, I think 1987 or so. And this is the building by Raymond Abraham on Friedrichstrasse in Berlin. There is a certain formalism here in his work that uh, one could question a little bit, but, but his building still stands out. And in a, in, a, in a field where it's not so easy to make something that stands out. Not that this is the purpose of architecture necessarily, to make something to stand out by all means. No, he was a serious architect, uh, but um, yeah, certain aspects of formalism are present, I would say, in his architecture. And looking at this facade of the building, you wouldn't expect the round courtyard that is actually behind the facade. Not far away from here is uh, also, there are three buildings built by the dean of the Cooper Union in New York, meaning John Haydock. And from there also not too far away is the Jewish Museum by um, the protege of John Haydock and one of the students at Cooper Union, that is Daniel Lipsky. And look at the plan. So we see the elevation here towards Friedrichstrasse, but then we don't quite expect, uh, you know, the, this kind of uh, round uh, courtyard in the back. Elementary architecture, maybe Aravena would uh, would be interested uh, to, you know, uh, well, if he didn't read this book, he probably did with his elemental architecture. And this is the courtyard 
of the building in Berlin with this uh, rather mannerist uh, break here. Friedrich Strasse. Now, this is a house he built also in Austria. Uh, yes, uh, you would say it's, a, it's an opulent house, um, you know, with a certain degree of uh, quiet monumentality, white as it is, mean, meaning modernist, blank walls. Um, what can we say? You know, uh, an opulent villa for someone who can afford to, to live on top of a hill. Perfectly symmetrical. The only asymmetry is provoked by the swimming pool. <clears throat> now, another interesting work by him, the House of Music. I think it's his latest, the last work he built uh, in Austria. Concrete, exposed concrete. in a country where music is so important and uh, celebrated, that this architect uh, had the chance to build the house of music, not a house for music, but the house of music. That's not a little thing. There are residences here as well. Um, So I guess they have exhibitions, they have concerts, and they have residences inside this uh, house of music. The tension between uh, geometrical um, uh, primary figures, you know, the circle, the triangle, the square, the radish junctions here too. His friend Bernard Chumi would have seen them too. We know he, he wrote about, uh, he published a book about architectural disjunctions. And I think we need disjunctions because the disjunctions with their negativity force us to aspire towards, towards conjunctions. But conjunctions which like the light at the end of, of a tunnel go first through the darkness of the tunnel. So I, I think, <clears throat> Even, even in alchemy, you know, separatio, separation, disjunction is prior to bringing together, to uniting. <clears throat> this is the plan. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The plan of the House of Music by uh, Raymond Abraham. You would find it surprising that an architect of um, idiosyncratic modernity was actually an, an admirer, a lover even of symmetry. <clears throat> you would say that symmetry is uh, the, um, you know, the is uh, is uh, appreciated by the conformist. But here we have symmetry being appreciated and used by the non-conformist. Maybe this would, it would have infuriated Bruno Sevi, who said that uh, uh, modern architecture cannot be asymmetric, cannot be symmetrical. Well, we have one of the avant-garde architects in New York City working with sym symmetry quite obviously. So maybe Bruno Sevi was not quite correct after all. Although we could understand why he appreciated asymmetry so much. Maybe the symmetry in the case of Raymond Abraham uh, has some kind of a connection with his uh, concern with uh, 
to put it simply, with death, with the immobility of death. But on the other hand, here we see how the light um, falls into these um, architectural disjunctions and provoke a zigzagging, which is, uh, um, you know, irritating the above mentioned uh, symmetry. Exposed concrete, but the plan wouldn't wouldn't let you imagine something like this, and yet it is. The House of Music, Austria, Raymond Abraham, and there we see. I always like the conjunction between wood and concrete, because like in the work, some works by Louis Kahn, wood brings in some something intimate, something warm, and uh, then some balance is created between the, the cold conglomerate that concrete is. I refer to the, to the, the evaluation of Frank Lloyd Wright, who saw that <clears throat> concrete is a conglomerate. He actually didn't like concrete very much, Frank Lloyd Wright. He used it sometimes, but he didn't quite like it. He was not very comfortable with concrete and he called it a conglomerate. But when you have wood in conjunction with, and disjunction with concrete, then the two balance each other and uh, you have some kind of a, you know, uh, hole that, uh, that the sum of the parts is bigger than, than the, the arithmetic sum of the parts. One plus one equals more than two. That's what I'm trying to say. This would have been a good picture <clears throat> if the if the clouds were not so dramatized on, you know, maybe through Photoshop or I don't know what. But I also noticed the fact that there is no asphalted road that leads to the entrance into the house of music. And I, I, I imagine this was a deliberate decision. The reality of the unbuilt. This was an exhibition that took place in the House of Music. The reality of the unbuilt. Uh, you know, this is a paradoxical, uh, you know, uh, way to put it. It's almost like saying the reality of the unreal. But the unbuilt is not unreal, actually. You know, if it's not built, it doesn't mean it's not real. I mean, there are so many buildings that are built and they're actually not real. And there are so many drawings. I just mentioned, uh, you know, Antonio Santelia, which are very real, although they are just drawings. So you could have a drawing which is very real and you could have built buildings and many which are not real at all. The Delancey Tower in New York City was a proposal, was not built by Raymond Abraham. So an, an unrealized project by uh, Abraham for a structure on Delancey Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This person, you know, I mean, this person, Maurice Blanchot wrote in the Song of the Sirens, in what direction is architecture moving? Architecture moves towards itself to dissolve in itself to become speechless for the sake of silence, yet filled with a desire to signify its solitude, silent, unknown sign, in the written image, immutable, in the drawn image, unspeakable, in the built image, un uninhabitable. The mystery of these images becomes the myth of the journey of architecture and the odyssey of the imaginary inhabitants who attempt to decipher them. This is a, an homage to an architecture of idealism. And this is, it, it would have been nice if it was built, it was not. But for thinking, for the spirit of architecture, they are still significant in as much as the scattered columns fragmented and eroded by time of Persepolis are.
and two other unrealized projects by Ra Raymond uh, Abraham, the Beijing Center for Well-Being. I mean, I don't know what to think about this well-being. Anyway, apparently he did such a project but was not built. And New York City, ground zero, a bird's eye view, the World Trade Center. He tried his hand at it too. I can't understand very well what's going on here. The World Towers. Now here is a little bit uh, more uh, decipherable what he did try to do, but I can't see the context. I couldn't find uh, a lot of pictures with this project by uh, Raymond uh, Abraham. Now the hinge chair, which says a lot about him, look at this. This is clearly uh, intended to epate la bourgeoisie, to shock the bourgeois. You know, uh, a split chair. <laughs> a schismatic chair, uh, a chair in convulsions, a chair that uh, is hard to use as a chair. But it makes a statement about the schism within ourselves. You know, the, the inner schism, the psychic schism. It's a typical uh, Cooper Union product, this, this chair. Raymond Abraham, the functionalist would obviously protest. But who cares about the functionalist? Certainly not uh, Raymond Abraham. We need provocations, otherwise life becomes unbearable. Really, we need, we need the unemployable, uh, you know, mavericks. And now I show the project, um, the New York Times, that he proposed for New York Times. It, there was a competition, and I took part in that competition too. I didn't win, but he won. Uh, this is the project he did. In my opinion, a little bit um, mechanical. He just superimposed uh, theaters, you know, I don't know how many, eight, ten uh, theaters, one on top of the other. Because, yes, 42nd Street, uh, you know, was, was a street. I don't know if it still is. I imagine it is, you know, the street of, uh, of uh, cinemas and theaters. And then here he created, he stacked them one above the other. Personally, I don't think he did such a great uh, proposal, but, uh, but he won. Anyway, Raymond Abraham in Times Square. Uh, here I can show you what I did for that competition. Uh, this was my drawing. And what I did, for those who know New York City, uh, there was Broadway and 7th Avenue intersecting at 45th Street in Manhattan. And I proposed, although the competition asked for just the Times Tower, uh, I proposed two towers. One to replace the Coca-Cola building. <clears throat> and at that time I was reading uh, Psychology and Alchemy by Carl Jung. So I was influenced by that book. So I proposed two towers facing each other. A tower for South, for the king, because redness, a red tower, a redness symbolizes in alchemy, the king, the sun, uh, fire, and uh, at equal distance from the crossroads of the world, meaning Broadway and 7th Avenue, I imagine the White Tower symbolizing the queen, the moon, and the water. So here you have the queen, uh, water, and north as well. And here you, you have the king, south, the sun, and fire. Fire and water. Uh, redness and whiteness the king and the queen. Uh, so, you know, it was about uh, the conjunction of opposites. And if you would have uh, uh, projected the towers on the land, on the site, they would have met exactly where the crossroads of the world is, meaning at 45th Street, at equal distance from the former, in my proposal, Coca-Cola building 
and uh, you know the Times Square, which was supposed to uh, you know be built here in lieu of a building that existed. And in front of the towers, both towers, I placed two, I imagine, two giant urban thrones that on the, on the white half of the world would see the red king, and on the red half of the world would see the white queen, and they would face each other. So here you see, this would have been huge. I mean, as a human being, you could have passed uh, through underneath uh, the you know the seat of these uh, giant urban chairs. So it was really an attempt to uh, unite the opposites and to play with the mythical themes of uh, the south and the north, fire and water, the king and the queen, uh, and so on. This was my proposal. So I thank you.